Hello, squirrel listeners. Can't wait to see what happens today. I was not believing Miss Cornelia's message from yesterday. Could y'all? I did not see that coming. But I did wonder why that Elliot guy was came on the scene. So today we're at chapter 38 of Anne's House of Dreams. If you're new, joining us new, if I were you, I would go back because we're almost finished with this book. Uh, go back to the beginning. All the books I've read are in playlists. If you go to my playlist, they should be there by titles. And I have just uh, abbreviated a lot of my books. A I'm just that lazy. A-H-O-D is Anne's House of Dreams. And I think it's the fifth book in the Anne of Avonlea series. We've read the, the others leading up to this. And we've got a few more to read after. I know that one of my subscribers said in a comment on here yesterday that uh, she quit reading the series after this book and she couldn't remember whether she just couldn't get into it or wasn't that as good as the others or whatever. But I'm hoping that it seems to me like each one has been better than the one before. They're all good. They're all good. And I've got lots and lots of books. The Christmas Carol is one of them from Charles Dickens. My very favorite Charles Dickens and favorite Christmas story. And wow, we've got Tom Sawyer. We've got Laura Ingalls Wilder. Um, Little House on the Prairie. Sorry, it disappeared for a minute. Anyway, there's bunches of them. So you can just turn on a playlist, and it. I think if you hit play all, it goes from one to the next, and have your own <laughs> Granny Audible free while you sit and crochet or knit or spin or whatever it is you do. All right, now back into it. Chapter 38, Red Roses. The garden of the little house was a haunt beloved of bees and reddened by late roses that August. The little house folk lived much in it and were given to taking picnic suppers in the grassy corner beyond the brook and sitting about in it through the twilights when great night moths, like a luna moth, those are so pretty, sailed athwart the velvet gloom. Athwart. Athwart. One evening, Owen Ford found Leslie alone in it. Anne and Gilbert were away, and Susan, who was expected back that night, had not yet returned. The northern sky was amber and pale green over the fir tops. The air was cool, for August was nearing September, and Leslie wore a crimson scarf over her white dress. Together they wandered through the little friendly flower-crowded paths in silence. Owen must go soon. His holiday was nearly over. Leslie found her heart beating wildly. <clears throat> I was thinking this would be a perfect setting for, uh, you know what? Let's see. Her heart was beating wildly. She knew that this beloved garden was to be the scene of the binding words that must seal their as yet unworded understanding. Some evenings a strange odor blows down the air of this garden like a phantom perfume, said Owen. I've never been able to discover from just what flower it comes. It's elusive and haunting and wonderfully sweet. I like to fancy it's the soul of Grandmother Selwyn passing on a little visit to the old spot she loved so well. There should be a lot of friendly ghosts about this little old house. I've lived under its roof only a month, said Leslie, but I love it as I've never loved the house over there where I have lived all my life. This house was builded, not built, builded and consecrated by love, said Owen. Such houses must exert an influence over those who live in them. And this garden, it's over 60 years old and the history of a thousand hopes and joys is written in its blossoms. Some of those flowers were actually set out by the schoolmaster's bride, and she has been dead for 30 years, yet they bloom on every summer. Look at those red roses, Leslie. How they queen it over everything else. 
I love the red roses, said Leslie. Ann likes the pink ones best, and Gilbert likes the white, but I want the crimson ones. They satisfy some craving in me as no other flower does. These roses are very late. They bloom after all the others have gone, and they hold the warmth and soul of the summer come to fruition, said Owen, plucking some of the glowing half-opened buds. The rose is the flower of love. The world hasn't claimed it so for centuries. The pink roses are love hopeful and expectant. The white roses are love dead or forsaken. I remember, let's stop there just for a minute. Side note, um, on Mother's Day, it used to be a thing. I don't know if people still do it or not, but on Mother's Day, I guess Mother's Day is always a Sunday, the 3rd, whatever, of May. Um, but we would always wear red roses, except for Daddy, whose mom had passed, and he had to have a white rose. And we had the bushes in our yard, so we'd just go out and get them. But I remember just that brought that to mind. Uh, white roses are loved, dead, or forsaken, but the red roses, ah, Leslie, what are the red roses? Love triumphant, said Leslie in a low voice. Yes, love triumphant and perfect. Leslie, you know, you understand I have loved you from the first, and I know you love me. I don't need to ask you, but I want to hear you say it, my darling, my darling. Leslie said something in a very low and tremulous voice. Their hands and lips met. It was life's supreme moment for them. And as they stood there in the old garden, with its many years of love and delight and sorrow and glory, he crowned her shining hair with the red, red rose of a love triumphant. So he's not even going to ask her and she's not going to say it. <laughs> Anna Gilbert returned presently, accompanied by Captain Jim. Anne lighted a few sticks of driftwood in the fireplace for love of the pixie flames, and they sat around it for an hour of good fellowship. When I sit looking at a driftwood fire, it's easy to believe I'm young again, said Captain Jim. Can you read futures in the fire, Captain Jim? asked Owen. He's going to tell him now. Captain Jim looked at them all affectionately and then back again at Leslie's vivid face and glowing eyes. I don't need the fire to read your futures, he said. I see happiness for all of you, all of you. For Leslie and Mr. Ford and the doctor here and Mistress Blythe and little Jim and children that ain't born yet but will be. Happiness for you all, though mind you, I reckon you'll have your troubles and worries and sorrows too. They're bound to come in no house. Whether it's a palace or a little house of dreams can bar them out, but they won't get the better of you if you face them together with love and trust. You can weather any storm with them two for compass and pilot. The old man rose suddenly and placed one hand on Leslie's head and one on Anne's. Two good, sweet women, he said, true and faithful and to be depended on. Your husbands will have honor in the gates because of you. Your children will rise up and call you blessed in the years to come. There was a strange solemnity about the little scene. Anne and Leslie bowed as those receiving a benediction. Gilbert suddenly brushed his hand over his eyes. Owen Ford was wrapped as one who can see visions. All were silent for a space. The little house of dreams added another poignant and unforgettable moment to its store of memories. I must be going now, said Captain Jim slowly at last. He took up his hat and looked lingering lingeringly about the room. I'm afraid he's going to pass soon. Good night, all of you, he said as he went out, and, pierced by the unusual wistfulness of his farewell, ran to the door after him. Come back soon, Captain Jim, she called as he passed through the little gate hung between the firs. Aye, aye, he called cheer cheerily back at her. But Captain Jim, uh, had sat by the old fireside of the House of Dreams for the last time. I know it. I know it. Foreshadowing. Foreshadowing. Anne went slowly back to the others. It's so 
so pitiful to think of him going all alone down to that lonely point, she said, and there's no one to welcome him there. Captain Jim is, is such good company for others that one can't imagine him being anything but good company for himself, said Owen. But he must often be lonely. There was a touch of the seer about him tonight, as he spoke as one to whom it had been given to speak. Well, I must be going too. Anne and Gilbert discreetly melted away, but when Owen had gone, Anne returned to find Leslie standing by the hearth. Oh, Leslie, I know, and I'm so glad, dear, she said, putting her arms about her. Anne, my happiness frightens me, whispered Leslie. It seems too great to be real. I'm afraid to speak it, to think it, of it. It seems to me that it must just be another another dream of this house of dreams and it will vanish when i leave here well you're not going to leave here until owen takes you you're going to stay with me until that time comes do you think i'd let you go over to that lonely sad place again um thank you dear i meant to ask you if i might stay with you i didn't want to go back there it would seem like going back into the chill and dreariness of the old life again Anne, Anne, what a friend you've been to me a good sweet woman true and faithful and to be depended on captain jim summed you up he said women not woman smiled Anne. perhaps captain jim sees us both through the rose-colored spectacles of his love for us. But we can try to live up to his belief in us, at least. Do you remember, Anne, said Leslie slowly, that I once said that night we met on the shore that I hated my good looks? I did then. It always seemed to me that if I had been homely, Dick would never have thought of me. I hated my beauty because it had attracted him. But now, oh, I'm glad that I have it. It's all I have to offer, Owen. His artist soul delights in it. I feel as if I do not come to him quite empty-handed. Owen loves your beauty, Leslie. Who would not? But it's foolish of you to say that you think that's all you bring to him. He will tell you that. I needn't. And now I must lock up. I expected Susan back tonight, but she's not come. Oh, yes, here I am, Mrs. Dr. Dear, said Susan, entering unexpectedly from the kitchen and puffing, like a hen drawing rails at that. It's quite a walk from the glen down here. I'm glad to see you back, Susan. How's your sister? She's able to sit up, but of course she can't walk yet. However, she's very well able to get on without me now. And her daughter has come home for her vacation, and I am thankful to be back, Mrs. Doctor, dear. Matilda's leg was broken, and no mistake, but her tongue was not. <laughs> and she would talk the legs off an iron pot, that she would, Mrs. Doctor, dear, though I grieve to say it of my own sister. She was always a great talker, and yet she was the first of our family to get married. She really did not care much about marrying James, I guess it's Clow, but she could not bear to disoblige him. Not but what James is a good man. The only fault I have to find with him is that he always starts in to say grace with such an unearthly groan, Mrs. Dr. Dear. It always frightens my appetite clear away. And speaking of getting married, Mrs. Dr. Dear, is it true that Cornelia Bryant's going to be married to Marshall Elliott? Yes, quite true, Susan. Well, Mrs. Dr. Dear, it does not seem fair to me. Here, I, here is me, who never said a word against the men, and I cannot get married no how. And there's Cornelia Bryant, who has never done, is never done abusing them. And all she has to do is reach out her hand and pick one up, as it, as it were. It's a very strange world, Mrs. Dr. Dear. There's another world, you know, Susan. Yes, said Susan with a heavy sigh, but Mrs. Dr. Dear, there's neither marrying nor giving in marriage there. And that's all. The next chapter is chapter 39, Captain Jim Crosses the Bar. Oh. <laughs> gonna be sad doggone it 
I just want these characters to live forever. Have a happy December night. It's Wednesday hump day. December night. And I just put up my vlogmas for today, which has a little yarny confession in it. Make sure you watch it. And I totally caught up with the days before. And this is what I pulled out today. But y'all go back and look at it. Please and thank you. And I appreciate your thumbs. Thummy, thumb, thumbs. And if I didn't already say it, I'll be live at 5. I hope to see you there. That's 5 Eastern. Okay, be sweet. Don't be ugly. I may be back on with the happy mail because I do have this one card and it's from Miss Karen. Miss Karen Robinson. And it's so cute. She got it all decorated up. The only reason I didn't open it right away was I thought, you know, I hadn't checked the mail yet yesterday. And then I just forgot to get back to it because I was trying to make sure I got all caught up with this. <laughs> my little one lace row repeat. Well, it's not my pattern, but I made it mine by adding some garter rows to it. I'm just calling it, I'm not writing it up or anything, but the every season or any season scarf. And I think it may be a gift, boo-boos and all, to someone that I owe some stuff to. A couple people that I, I several, all of you I owe. <laughs> Maybe one of these days I'll get as many of you as I can. Some happy mail, even if it's just stitch markers. Mwah. Love you bunches. And I do hope to see you live at five. Love you. Bye-bye.